Well, dear friends, do not judge and you will not be judged, says Jesus in this great sermon on the plain, the passage we heard in today's gospel. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Now, what in the world does this really mean? This phrase that has been cited over and over again. Such a popular verse, especially today in the 21st century. Many, many people, some who are Christian, some who are not Christian, latch on to this phrase and use it in all kinds of ways, even as a weapon. Truly, I think it's our modern world's favorite biblical verse, hands down. It's often used as a sort of scriptural proof text for relativism, especially moral relativism. The belief that all morality, the way we live, making good actions or bad actions, the moral relativist believes that all morality, all moral action is changeable, subjective, and individual. Different strokes for different folks. I'm okay, you're okay, let's not judge anybody. And if you dare to judge anyone's action or behavior or lifestyle, and if you call yourself a Christian, well, you're a hypocrite. Why? Well, because Jesus said plainly, judge not, lest ye shall be judged. Of course, while making such a blatant finger-pointing observation, the moral relativist often fails to see that he himself is casting judgment and therefore calling himself a hypocrite. So anyway, let's circle back to this verse. Do not judge and you will not be judged. This is a great example of a scriptural text that can be so badly misinterpreted. It might be the best example since this phrase in question is so often lifted out of context before being weaponized from the fortresses of relativism. This line which is so often used to justify not judging people's actions. Now what is needed here is a careful careful reading of the text and to keep this commonly cited phrase in view of all the other moral teachings that Jesus imparts in the Gospels, teachings that have a rich coherency. Do not judge and you will not be judged. We can see with our own eyes in our Sunday missiles, it's not even a full sentence. What's the full sentence? Here it is. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Now, is this last part important? Yes, it's very important, big time. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. What we have here is something so common in Hebrew writing, and in this case, impacting the original Greek of the New Testament. In Hebrew culture, and this is evident most profoundly in the Psalms, you have what is called a synonymous parallelism. It's a fancy way of saying two or more similarly worded phrases sandwiched right up next to one another. Two or more phrases that more than complement one another, they actually interpret one another. Kind of like saying the same thing twice for impact. So do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. And here, Jesus does not mean that you cannot evaluate or judge the moral value of an action or habit. Rather, what Jesus is getting at here is that one cannot pass judgment or condemn a person. One cannot pass judgment on the state of a person's soul. One cannot pass judgment, certainly, on the destiny of a person's soul. Condemnation means pronouncing a final negative verdict on a person. And the only one who has the authority to do any such pronouncing is God. Only God can make the final judgment. Now, even at this point, the relativist could argue that Jesus could very well still mean that it's not for anyone to either judge or condemn either a person or a person's actions. Well, well, what do we do? We come back to that key interpretive principle. We keep looking at things in context. 
what does the very next phrase say? This is in our gospel. It says this, forgive and you will be forgiven. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The whole idea of forgiveness presupposes that someone has done something morally wrong. Someone has broken a standard. The victim feels it. The victim knows it. The victim, without doing too much calculating work, the victim and those who have witnessed the sin, they instinctively make a judgment on the action. They know an action is good. They know another action is bad. It's, it's a judgment call, a healthy evaluation, one that Jesus is not suppressing in this teaching. It's a given. Evaluating actions, it's a given. Jesus does it all throughout the gospel. St. Paul does it all throughout his letters and so on. Judgments undergird the virtue of justice itself and the whole art of loving fraternal correction, for instance, presupposes a discerning judgment of actions based on an objective moral code. You parents, you know, you do it all the time with children. Our whole legal system is based on judging actions in a discerning manner. In short, it's okay to judge action. It's okay to applaud or correct after a judgment has been made. It's another thing to attempt to presume the state of a person's soul or of his or her destiny. This we cannot do, says Jesus, and the warning is very clear. Now, it must be said, though we do have this God-given license to evaluate action, though this is the case, we cannot abuse the license. We cannot weaponize this privilege. When it comes to fraternal correction, when it, when it comes to judging negative action, no, we can't water down the truth, but... We can't, we can't hammer someone over the head with it either. Mercy, compassion, prudence, true justice. The truth must be clothed with these virtues. The effect of any appropriate judgment must be charitably disarming. Otherwise, what happens? More damage can be done. More harmful division takes place. And let's go back, right back to our first reading today and see how following through with a judgment is executed, not viciously, but virtuously. This great scene from the first book of Samuel. There's young David after being hunted. He's being hunted by the ravenously jealous king, King Saul. David, before he goes charitably on the offensive, he judges. David judges. Implicit in this scene is a whole series of appropriate moral judgments. David, he does not condemn Saul. David knows that Saul was God's anointed, his anointed one. But David also makes the judgment that despite Saul's dignity, he's got some problems. He's got some serious problems. David judges that he's got to be careful around Saul. David makes the correct judgment that Saul blinded by envious rage, will kill him if Saul is given the chance. And David also makes the judgment that Saul must learn a lesson in order for peace to take shape, both in the kingdom and in Saul's own heart. So what does David do? He hatches this unorthodox plan, not to eliminate the threat, but to help Saul. David literally loves his enemy in this scene, and it's, it's a disarming lesson. David sneaks in, and by the grace of God, David and his cohort are not heard by any of the sleeping soldiers. And David, with this perfect opportunity, if he wanted to, to kill this mad, vengeful king, David, he goes down another path. David, he, he, he takes King Saul's own spear, and then he walks away, quiet, effective, virtuous warfare, and no lives are lost. And Saul, when it is revealed to him what David has done, Saul, this tragic figure, Saul, he cries out in earnest, blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things and will succeed in them. And here it is. This is, this is the gospel being lived out in David's time. What an application of mercy. 
that follows a healthy series of judgments. And David, he never once condemns Saul. David is always highlighting Saul's dignity. Again, this is the gospel. This is the gospel being lived out 1,000 years before Christ. And it's applicable today, brothers and sisters. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. And Jesus teaches us this not just so that we may avoid condemnation, but rather all of it is geared toward spurring us forward to offer mercy. Our first response to other people's sinfulness should be compassion and mercy. Why? Because that's what God offers us. Mercy, compassion, forgiveness. In his letter entitled The Face of Mercy, Pope Francis he exhorts us, he says, to be instruments. He exhorts us to be instruments of mercy because, he says, it was we who first received mercy from God, to be generous with others, knowing that God showers his goodness upon us with immense generosity, says Pope Francis. And dear friends, we know, we know the grave consequences of judging people, of fixing a condemning label on people. The ugly result of this kind of judgment is very clear. But let us not be afraid to evaluate action. And, let, and most importantly, let us make any intervention, any teaching moment, any articulation of tough love, let us make these opportunities occasions where charity can rule, occasions of disarming mercy. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us.